this car is a part of the family. It's rather like sitting inside a bucket, to be honest. You have to be a car person to appreciate it. Sweet, smooth, and sassy. I gotta step on the gas. I kind of go crazy. I go berserk. And I love it. This whole thing started real early with me. Uh, I was four years old. I started to school and I fell in love with a brand new 32 Chevrolet purchased by a lady near the school and I developed a taste for Chevrolets. Louis Chevrolet came to New York from Montreal in the early 1900s, and Louis was a natural mechanic, just a natural. He got into racing and he become uh, very popular, and he was good. And he attracted the attention of Billy Durant, the founder uh, of the General Motors Corporation. And uh, eventually, Billy Durant hired he and his brother, and they produced a big Chevrolet, a big car. 120 inch wheelbase, big T-head engine, lots of horsepower, but it was not really to the liking of Mr. Durant. Mr. Durant wanted something a little more on the low price field, something to compete with Ford, who was the, the fellow that was out front in sales. And there's the story about Mr. Durant won Louis Chevrolet to smoke cigars while Louis was satisfied with smoking cigarettes, and he did. And Mr. Chevrolet told Mr. Durant I gave you my name, and I gave you my services, and I helped you build a new car, but I'm not selling myself to you, and he left. By the mid-1920s, uh, Chevrolet was the second best-selling car in America, outsold only by Henry Ford's Model T. Price, of course, was an extremely important factor, and one brochure for the, the two-door coach very prominently displays a price of only $645. In, in 1929, uh, Chevrolet's next step was to introduce a six-cylinder car, and again, price, uh, price was emphasized in the sales brochures along with a few technical details, but uh, uh, price to a large extent was what sold the car. We are driving a 1930 Chevrolet. We have traveled with the car from coast to coast, north to south, east to west. The car travels best at 40 miles an hour. I drive for one hour and Rita could hardly wait until it's her turn. Then uh, we will pull off to the side of the road, change uh, seats, and Rita drives for an hour. We've had this car for over 30 years. This is the only car that we've had, and we certainly are not looking for another one. We feel that if we live that long, this car will run for another 30 years. <laughs> this car is a part of the family. There is my wife, Rita, myself, and this is the third member. At first I thought, oh, I shall never be able to endure going just 40 miles an hour because I like to go a little more rapidly. But you inure to it and you become accustomed to it. It's very gutsy. It's, it has a lot of courage. It's a very brave car. It'll start under any circumstance. It'll go up any hill. Uh, it's been just wonderful to have the opportunity to be in an antique vehicle. And every time I get behind the wheel, I feel like I'm a kid again. The car is over 60 years old at this point and still going strong, but I think it's because Al takes such wonderful care of it. Any little thing that he even anticipates isn't right, he will look into it. He's very devoted to that, and I do not fear going anywhere in the antique car. Chevrolet has been my life. I started in 1949. It is a great place to work. And I had always said, working for Chevrolet 
that was a great life. But let's also remember there's a lot of living to be done in retirement and we are enjoying every minute of it. The six-cylinder engine was popular until uh, Chevrolet came out with an eight-cylinder. That was 1955, many years after the 1930, 1929 was developed. You have to realize that these are mechanical brakes and you have to allow additional time for stopping. The transmission is a non-synchro mesh. Chevrolet didn't have a synchro mesh until 1932. It's a lot of fun. Chevrolet's reputation was nearly unblemished, I would say, during the 30s and even the early 40s and beyond because Chevrolet was number one. They were the sales leader outside of a few scarce years, and, and, and they just offered a value for your dollar in a Chevrolet, and, and they took pride in that, and this is what they built their business on. By December, 1st of December 1941, we were in war with Japan. The civilian production of automobiles was totally mothballed, and Chevrolet produced shells, they produced trucks, they produced trailers, they produced uh, a lot of different variations of military vehicles and, and this type of thing for the war. After the war, the, the production was a carryover from the 41-42 models and remained that way pretty much until 1949. Harley Earl uh, was in charge of styling. He wanted to do more with colors. He thought we should have two tones. He, we, he thought we should have more exotic features on cars. From the brilliant new General Motors line for 1955. Chevrolet Bel Air Sport Coupe. <laughs> This is a 1955 Chevrolet, top of the line, a Bel Air convertible. America had fallen in love with the automobile. There was a radical vein of independence that uh, raced through the American heart and everyone could now own a car. It was possible to go down and put a few hundred dollars down and actually finance a car, which was relatively new thinking in the United States. It was designed so the average blue-collar worker could buy it and enjoy it. In fact, in 1955, Chevrolet manufactured 41,000 convertibles. And the production figures for 1955 exceeded 1.7 million units. Uh, so consequently, Chevrolet really began to be the name in America. In the late 80s, Chevrolet was asked to be the pace car again at the Indy 500. And what they wanted to do was to develop a small museum near the 500 where they could show off all the pace cars that they'd had from the previous times. This is the only 55 pace car to have actually been at the 500 on two separate occasions. In 1955, Chevrolet introduced the phrase, the hot one. And in 56, they enlarged on that and it became the hot gets hotter. And in the 1957, it was sweet, smooth, and sassy. Standard steering. If you couple Super that marketing smooth. genius together with the, the uh, interstate road system that really began to come into its own by the mid-50s, you can understand how America could really see the USA in their Chevrolet. <laughs> Probably the biggest change that Chevrolet made was the introduction of the V8. Chevrolet was not the first one to put a V8, of course, in, the, in a regular production car. Ford had been doing that for a number of years. But there was something about the V8 that Chevrolet introduced in 1955, something that Chevrolet captured that literally they never let go. During the 1950s, horsepower was not the only selling factor. Uh, the variety of colors and combinations of colors uh, had become a very strong selling point. 466 kinds of beauty for 1957 were 
offered. Matador red, tropical turquoise, canyon coral, highland green, dusk pearl, all of which could be combined with secondary colors such as India ivory, uh, imperial ivory, onyx black, and it just went on forever. I don't remember my grandfather or my aunts and uncles driving a 1955 Chevrolet. My neighbor did. It was a tropical turquoise and India ivory car that I remember as a child loving very much. He used to take us everywhere in it. It is my opinion that no other era will ever captivate uh, the automobile heart the way that the 1955, 56, and 57 Chevrolet did. This car is very special to me. I've owned it for almost 20 years. I brought many of my friends' first babies home from the hospital. I've chauffeured for weddings and uh, bar mitzvahs. I've just spent many fun hours and great times cleaning and working on this old red and white convertible. It's uh, very, very special. Well, while all this other hoopla was going on for the uh for the middle 50s cars, uh, th there was something else happening in the background that a lot of people didn't know until it all at once it hit. There was a terrific introduction of a brand new sports car. Nothing like it had ever been produced in this country before. Well, when they first came out with the Corvette, the people didn't know what Chevrolet was trying to do. And technically, I'm not sure if Chevrolet really knew what they wanted to do. You know, it wasn't too appealing to the public because the fact that it's six cylinder it wasn't really quick. So Mr. Arcus Duntoff come along and he saw the little six cylinder engine under the hood and he thought that that should be something different. And he being a Belgian born Russian descent, fella and a, just a natural engineer. So he talked Chevrolet into letting him work on the Corvette team. On top, began on the design team and said, let's park this car up some. And actually, he's the one that rescued the Corvette. Then in 57, they came out with the 283, 283 horsepower. That was one horsepower per cubic inch. That helped it out a lot. That really put the car on the market. There's nothing that rides like a Corvette, and there's nothing that sounds like a Chevrolet engine. They all have their individual ring. And I can't describe the feeling. It's a great feeling. You have to be a car person to appreciate it. You know, sitting behind the wheel of the car going down a highway, the way the dash is designed, and like, the way the car sort of wraps around you in a roundabout way, and everything is right there, you know, like it, it's, it's, it's hard to describe driving, it's just, I love it. I mean, there's a lot of things that make a Corvette a Corvette. One of the things is the sound of the engine. It makes you want to go back to that era because things were less hectic then and a lot more fun and a lot less complicated. There had to be a, a new idea of making a body out of fiberglass. Uh, Actually, it wasn't really fiberglass. They called it something else. Uh, glass reinforced plastic. Yeah, glass reinforced plastic. They called it, and uh, when they started building the first one, it went along so so great. It takes a lot of weight off the car. They say, and it just it just changes the aerodynamics of the car. Let's put it that way. But one thing, you know, people say, oh, I wouldn't drive in a Corvette because it's plastic. That may be the truth, but the frame on a Corvette is a full frame compared to a lot of these cars today that are unibody construction and are only seen together with a weld. And I've seen people actually walk away from pretty bad accidents with Corvettes. He has the 57 and I have the 87. Uh, my oldest daughter has the 79. My other daughter has the 65 convertible. She just had a baby, so we're gonna have to get her a Barbie Corvette. Now, I don't mean a plastic one, I mean a fiberglass go-kart. 
and we'll have to get it painted pink. And my other daughter, she had an 81, and her son has a 95 uh, pace car go-kart. After driving drag racing cars and all, and being away from drag racing for like oh, about 15 years now, when I get in that car and I start going down the highway, and knowing that it's got dual four barrels, and it's a four speed, I kind of go crazy, I go berserk. And I gotta step on the gas, and I gotta try and bang the gears. And all it does is get me in trouble with the local police down here. You know, right now I gotta bide my time <laughs> a couple more months, and all the points come off of my license, then I can go crazy again. <laughs> And it is baseball, apple pie, and Chevrolet. You know, it's a little bit of everything. That's what a Corvette is. It really, truly is. The original 1953 Chevrolet brochure was a very simple little piece of uh, stiff paper, about three inches by five inches, showing the car not in color. Af after 10 years on the market, the, uh, the Corvette had uh, proved itself a, a very saleable car. And the 1963 Corvette brochure, which introduced the distinctive Stingray Coupe, was much more in keeping with the, the nature of the car. The 1963 got a chassis that was as technologically advanced. It was independent suspension all round. This suddenly made the 1963 Corvette the best handling American car you could buy. And of course, Americans love their big engines, they love acceleration, and with independent suspension, you don't lift one wheel and spin it when you put your foot down hard. Both wheels dig into the tarmac, and off you go. My first taste of Corvettes in a really strong way came when I was lying in bed with flu in my early teens and as a special treat my dad bought me a American magazine I think it was Hot Rod. In this magazine there was a picture of a 1963 split window like this one drag racing with smoke coming off its tires hubcaps removed and bumpers and I just thought it was the most beautiful car I'd ever seen and I knew I had to have one. I was lucky enough to go to Newcastle University it had to be Newcastle because I'd read in Melody Maker about the great scene in Newcastle that was a developing back in 1965 with Eric Burden and the Animals and various other bands. A year or so later I was travelling on the top of a double-decker bus in Newcastle and I saw a Corvette parked outside a car dealer. I leapt off the bus at the next stop and ran back and saying, what's that Corvette doing there? And I was told that it had been left by Eric Burton, who was on a world tour, to be sold because the brakes weren't working properly. He was going to buy another one anyway, and it just had to go. Within a couple of hours, I'd found the money, struck up a deal, and drove off in the car. And ever since then, I have been driving Corvettes and been totally dedicated to them. styling of the Corvettes is so superb. It's not over the top, it's subtle, but it also owes a lot to glass fibre construction. They made hard cut edges which really could only be done in fibreglass and ever since then Corvettes have reflected the fibreglass heritage. Bill Mitchell became head of styling staff, as it was known in those days, in the early 60s. And he was absolutely the man behind this. So Bill would say to his styling guys, look, the only test for this car is if we take it past the local schoolyard, will all the boys stop playing, run up to the fence and whistle? If the boys whistle, then you know you've got it right. Part of the styling was based on the idea that the Corvette should have the same section as an aeroplane wing. Unfortunately, it was found that it has a tremendous negative a pressure area over the whole top of the hood or the bonnet of the car and uh, when I have driven one of these cars at 145 I have experienced very very light feeling at the front and the steering really going very light indeed 
taking your foot off instantly slams the back end down again. You think, well, I'd better not be so naughty and go this fast again. It must be said that in 1964, after only one year of production with this divided back window, it went to a single back window. There had been complaints you couldn't see police cars following you and all this sort of stuff. But I like it because it's so uncompromising. It's a bold statement. I mean, a sports car is not a practical vehicle anyway. So the split back window is not practical. So what? It just looks absolutely great. echo inside it. It's rather like sitting inside a bucket to be honest because of the interior shape but I love that. Corvette today are selling extremely well. They're still a very very expensive car by Chevrolet standards. Again I think they still cost probably twice as much as any other Chevrolet and they will easily exceed 30 miles to the gallon at a steady 70 miles an hour. This, I don't think this was the way Chevrolet planned it but it's in response to government legislation which demanded extreme efficiency, this is the way the cars have ended up and I love it. In the 84 to 96 Corvettes, a lot of people didn't buy them because they could only fit one set of golf clubs. And now in the 97, they made the trunk so big that you can fit two sets comfortably. So that's going to make a big difference in it, too. They did a fabulous job, and it handles great, and you still feel you're in a Corvette. At one time, I did have a total of about 70. We're down to half of that now. But uh, we can't collect all the cars, so I started collecting the other things, like the signs, the memorabilia, the history and all the little jewelry items, and the toys, and the models. I, I love Chevrolets. I'm incredibly loyal to them, and there's something about baseball, hot dogs, apple pies, and Chevrolet that really are a slice out of Americana. I've just passed 50 years old, and I've been driving Corvettes now for um, about 25 years but I've still got uh, more than 25 years to go because my father is 82 and he's driving a 1989 Corvette and he drives it extremely fast. And I think we both agree that uh, driving Corvettes makes us feel great and puts a big grin on our faces. I acquired a name, Mr. Chevrolet, and it would be pretty hard to uh, be disloyal to that today. So I, I'll continue with Chevrolet regardless of what they put out and what the product is, I'll drive Chevrolets till the end.